liberalizations are the products of vulgar minds. I think struggle is a continuum. I think the hope is you want simply courtesy, politeness, to lubricate society. Not all of our problems are going to be solved by law. Some of these problems will solve them through social and economic changes. We will combat racism because we think it's a skirt that must be eliminated. It's like taking a step forward and then three steps back. Expressive forms of racist conduct should be challenged and I think this is what this campaign is about. We deserve dignity, we deserve to, re to respect each other. My name is Lefa Shope and I pledge to take on racism. I will learn about racism, talk about it, speak out against it and act to stop it. So pledge on Twitter at hashtag take on racism or on Facebook. <laughs>
they thought the airplanes were playing with them. They didn't realize that death was near. Fortunately for me, the police could not shoot at the side where I was standing. This was how I managed to get away. From Humphrey Tyler, assistant editor, Drum Magazine. Nobody seemed to be afraid. There were sudden shrills of cries of Izueletu. Women's voices, it sounded, from near the police. And all I could see, a small section of the crowd swirl around the Saracens and hands went up in the Africanist salute. Then the shooting started. We heard the chatter of a machine gun. Then another, then another. Hundreds of kids were running too. One little boy had on an old blanket coat, which he held up behind his head, thinking perhaps that it might save him from the bullets. Some of the children, hardly as tall as a grass, were leaping like rabbits. Some were shot too. Still, the shooting went on. One by one, the guns stopped. 69 people, men, women, and children were dead. In the wake of Sharpeville, the government declared a state of emergency. More than 18,000 people were arrested, including leaders of the ANC and the PAC, and both these organizations were banned and many were forced into exile. Sharpeville was to mark a turning point in the resistance and galvanize many to resist racist laws. It was indeed one of the catalysts that led to South Africa being put under the international spotlight. South African racism was now globally relevant. At United Nations headquarters, the Security Council places on its agenda a discussion of South Africa's apartheid crisis. Ambassador Lodge repeats the United States position, regretting the tragic loss of life in recent incidents, and votes to hear the charge raised by 29 member nations that the crisis has grave potentialities for international friction. Against the opposition of South Africa's representative, who argues that only a domestic matter is concerned, the item is placed on the agenda. A momentous decision by the World Organization. In South Africa, meanwhile, the work stoppage in protest against the past laws continues. Not only basic industry, but local shops and services are nearly paralyzed in major cities, as thousands of Africans stay away from their jobs. Throughout the nation, a sense of unrest mounts. Many pitch in on unfamiliar jobs in order that day-to-day -day affairs may continue. Demonstrations against the government by Africans continue on an increasing scale, despite the decree of a state of emergency and the arrest of hundreds of leaders of the opposition. Thousands in various parts of the country have marched to mourn those who lost their lives in the original Sharpsville and Langa incidents. In the years that followed, the resistance continued on a steadfast path for another 30 years until the release of Nelson Mandela and the unbanning of the ANC in 1990. It was only then that the institution of apartheid really began to crumble. Uphold and maintain the Constitution and all other laws of the Republic to discharge my duties with all my strength and talents. There's a great respect for individuals like uh, Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu. Uh, there's a respect for the fact that our press is free and lively and, and critical and open, that we have great diversity, that people are not afraid to express their points of view. But the things I'm most proud of, of having been connected with, is certainly the Constitution. Uh, the Constitutional Court, uh, the building, the artwork in that building, the judgments that we wrote, uh, these are all very, very tangible things. I'm doing a lot to preserve not my legacy, our nation's legacy, the history of how we came to make the Constitution. Working with Oliver Tambor in, um, uh, in Lusaka. 
But the legacy of apartheid and what it did to people's lives, both emotionally and economically, remains to this day. The spectre of racism still exists as the struggle continues. There is no doubt that um, you know the struggle for freedom and democracy in our country was uh, principally about uh, ending racial superiority and racial domination uh, to reaffirm the common humanity of, of all South Africans. Historically, I think it had a huge impact on us. I mean, I, my parents were living in Clip Town, and over time we were asked to leave the area, and so we were moved to, to Lanasia. We had a Clip Town reunion, so all the old families that used to live in Clip Town, it was a very big reunion. Some of them have met each other for after 40 years or 50 years, so it was quite a nostalgic environment and atmosphere. So people were forcibly removed. I grew up then in Lanasia. This is my 50th year in the community. It started off as an exclusively Indian uh, community. I went to an Indian school, both in primary school and high school. And then I had to go to an Indian university. Eventually, I had applied to go to Wits University uh, to do my undergraduate studies and my postgraduate. And I had to apply for what was called ministerial consent because Wits was a, an exclusively white university. And as an Indian, I had to apply for permission from the minister to attend that university. Well, I got the permission and I completed my studies. I can never allow myself to be trapped by my experiences of racism having grown up on a farm. Uh, having uh, played with a, a young a young boy who a f young boy the, the son of a farmer and seen over time as we were growing up how his life was different and mine was different uh, if, if one get trapped in that you would be bitter and nation building is about freeing ourselves also from the experiences that that can get us to be trapped too many South Africans have stories about past discrimination, like this one. The lasting effect it has on an individual, both emotionally and psychologically. Insider, outsider, this is fairly normal stuff. It's when you have laws and regulations and people are included in jobs or excluded or government, then you're talking about racism as, a, as an institution. In South Africa, the 21st of March is now known as Human Rights Day and holds special significance for us as a now free country. Human Rights Day to me really uh, gives us that opportunity to go in retrospect, uh, looking back from uh, where we come from, to check whether we have fulfilled our mandate for us as a commission in terms of reconciling people, inculcating the culture of human rights, uh, culture in South Africa. And that gives us an opportunity to look exactly whether we carried out our, our mandate. And if we have not done so, what is it that we need to do differently going forward? Human Rights Day means to me, it, well, it's very important. I think that South Africa has been through a lot and that it's important to recognise like, that we have human rights and everything and that people respect it and that it's just celebrated that we've come like, such a long way. It is such a day where you can celebrate your rights, that you are being treated well as other human beings. Yeah, Human Rights Day, I think it's a, it's a day we all the cultures in South Africa can come together for a change and talk to, you, talk to one another and get to know each other. It's um, mainly about um, freedom. We don't necessarily celebrate it the way it should be celebrated. I mean, when there's a public holiday of Human Rights Day, people are just like, woo! You know, it's not actually appreciated for the full depth of what it is. Human Rights Day, I think, is uh, just about bringing people together, um, bringing different cultures together, and just to celebrate this uh, rainbow nation that we live in. What's really critical for me in our Human Rights Day is to recognize that in order to get that equality, we really have to think about what makes that equality work. Because you, even if you have equal rights, given the legacy and where we've come from, and it's not about blaming things on the past, but it's about taking things forward. 
to take things forward, you have to think of equity centerfold. It's got to be the it's got to be the basis on which you decide how you're going to give people whose deprivation historically has put them at such a disadvantage. How do you give those people the opportunity to benefit from the equal rights? Recently, there have been flare-ups of racial incidents over 20 years into our fledging democracy. One such recent incident was with the real estate agent Penny Sparrow and her recent slur on social media about the Durban Beach Front on New Year's Day. And more recently, protesters and spectators clashed at a University of the Free State rugby match. We still have a long way to go. We, uh, we see the resurgence of racial incidents in our country. Um, and one of the main challenges we face is, uh, is that we still have a nation to build. More tension flared on the campus of University of Pretoria over the use of Afrikaans and the situation deteriorated into a clash between black students and their Afrikaner counterparts. They were about, about a group of part of the students being against Africans being used as the official language and part of tutoring language. So basically what students were saying was that they are demanding transformation from the university because it has been a long time whereby students tried to engage the university. But the demands of, of the match was that Africans at the University of Pretoria must be scrapped away in terms of it being a language of instruction, in terms of, in terms of it being a language of communication, in terms of it being a, a employment a, a requirement and also a culture. As an Afrikaans speaking student, I understood where the Afrikaans learners are coming from because I myself, since I came to varsity, I kind of had to cut out my language. I had to learn how to speak English and at times people still made fun of me because I didn't say the thing. I directly translated what Afrikaans words are into English to adapt to classes. So I understood their pain, but then I also understood with regards to the classes because it then becomes difficult sitting in a class where my closest friends are black friends. So where the lecturer translates something and you know when you translate it to English, it's not the exact same thing. Uh, I've heard about some couple of my friends. Uh, actually, I've heard about the, the both sides. For me as a foreigner, it's very difficult to uh, give an opinion on that issue. And uh, my suggestion is that the, the, the both parties uh, sit together and I think discuss these issues in the more peaceful environment so they can sort out, I think, much more better and, uh, you know, in the better manner. You're not expected to learn Afrikaans. It's just a cultural thing that we expect cultural diversity here. The rest is not culturally diverse. You come from uh, a Zulu background, a Bedi background, but then you have to learn one culture at the rest. Is. Why is it that it must be imposed on other people? We have 11 official languages, but are, is there someone in every language that is doing your course? In my first year, the mathematic lecturers were not English speaking. Um, most of them are foreign lecturers, so English doesn't come out, like they have a problem saying it correctly. Yes, they know the terms, they know what they want to explain, but it's sometimes difficult understanding what they are saying. So that's why I said it's when someone else is coming into it trying to explain another language that they've been taught, it becomes difficult. It cannot be that one official language, we have 11 official languages in South Africa, one official language dominates the rest now and pushes the others away. There's no uh, uh, room for, tra for, for transformation of the other languages to be accommodated. I think it's an isolated uh, case for me personally because I don't feel like, you know, personally like, me, myself, I went to an Afrikaner school. Like, I practically can't speak Afrikaans. And I don't, like, have anything against Afrikaans-speaking people. You understand? So I don't buy into that, for me, like, as a personal view. Well, I'm not quite sure with regards to the, the, the Afrikaans must fall what, what, what the point was, in my honest opinion, because I was uh, educated in English. I never had any problems with being an educated in English. There was no detriment uh, that I could gather from being educated in English. The only thing that I could tell was that the English lecturers were generally international. So 
they would maybe have been here for a few years less or just recently or so on and so maybe someone had an accent or they weren't quite versed or oiled in as it were into lecturing so that may have been a slight challenge but apart from that there was no there was no disadvantage to being taught in English at all. I don't agree with the movement motive. I don't see the problem in Africans being used. There's a lot of people who have graduated, a lot of people who have been successful through over the years with Afrikaans existing within the institutions. Well, we first of all have to understand our past because if you don't understand the past, you, you have a, a challenge how to deal with the future. And I s believe we are still grappling with the vestiges of apartheid and that whole thing of being different and, 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 and very subtle uh, being uh, superior. What I'm seeing in South Africa today, especially among some groups of whites, and I have to say, particularly amongst Afrikaners, some elements, a deliberate fight back. You took it away from us, we're going to get it back. And the discourtesy and the rudeness creates such anger. And there's an assumption that because apartheid is formally over, that it is over in our heads. Laws don't change mindsets. That's going to take generations. I've always known it. As a commission, we have been receiving cases around uh, racism throughout the existence of the commission, but they were very, very subtle. And uh, in some cases, they were not known because uh, they were happening be uh, between people at a very low level. And you'll notice that what's happening currently is that it's happening at a much higher level people who are members of parliament, people who are in leadership position. And that's something that uh, is of concern to us because as a commission, we expect those in high position, high leadership position, religious leaders uh, and uh, traditional leaders, politicians are the people who must pre preach reconciliation. I am concerned that there are appear to be small groups who actually deny the achievements of what Mr. Nelson Mandela, whose lawyer I was, uh, managed to uh, achieve. The Constitution has included in it that we should move to a non-racial society, which seems obvious. But do we all need to become anti-racist in order to become non-racial? Dr. Danny Titus explains. A non-racist, I would say, is someone who is really not influenced by racial superiority or racial inferiority. Somebody who is not touched by issues of racism. Uh, an anti-racist, I would think, is somebody who uh, purposefully opposes racism, who knows what it is, who knows what, it, uh, what forms it takes, and who definitely takes, and purposefully, as I said, takes a stand against it. At the moment in South Africa we are experiencing a lot of tension around racism because some of the fundamentals really haven't been um, addressed. When people uh, experience a, an erosion of their dignity, when they experience inequality, very often that experience is predicated on the fact that they are being treated badly by people who have various forms of power. And power really, um, although it's not entirely um, uh, dependent on people's economic status, but clearly people who are poorer, who live in more vulnerable and marginalized um, communities, experience the hardship of abuse by people with power, sometimes uh, made in a, in a, in a, um, or exercised, that power is exercised in a manner that is really um, showing callous disregard for people's dignity. Since much of the unrest and cries of economic racism are coming from the institutions of higher education, we thought it appropriate to visit some of the institutions in Gauteng and get more of the youth's perspective on the state of racism in South Africa. 
there's still that segregation. There's still, I'm going to be with black people because I'm comfortable, I'm going to be with white people because I'm comfortable, and obviously because of cultural differences. That's what sets us apart. But there's still that big elephant in the room. Once people start respecting that everyone's different, I come from a family where my dad's not South African, my mom's South African Afrikaans. So not only have I had a religious boundaries that I had to cross between Christian and Islamic, but I also had to cross the whole culture thing. But when you get to it, like once people learn that respect barrier between everyone, we can work past that. But right now we are not there. I must be honest, it's difficult for, for us white students um, because you know we, we we always have to I think accept that uh, that there is that there was that there was, was a sort of history, and we have to accept the concept of the white privilege. So, to me, uh, being an ally in the whole scheme of things is the best way to to go about doing it. Um, uh, sure, I am different in a sense because of my skin color, but at the end of the day, I think we're all fighting the same cause. We as students, we can just associate ourselves more with other students of different races. Maybe if we can interact with them more, we can just actually see that there's no difference. Like we are the same. So if we can just associate ourselves more and just not look at them as they're white, they're Indians, they're colored, you know. Many people look at race and automatically in their minds they decide that um, certain groups will behave in a certain way. It's just how society has, um, how we have been socialized. You see it everywhere. I mean, I feel like the campuses are divided racially already. You see it everywhere. You see it in some people when they're sitting at tables, there's clearly racial divisions. But you know, it is what it is. So often we limit ourselves to actually integrate with other people because of cultural barriers. We can break that down possibly and actually say to our neighbor, hey, I see you as a person, not for your color, not for your culture, but for who you are. That is what I'm interested in. People shouldn't be scared to integrate with each other just because their parents tell them not to. So I think it's all about raising awareness. Just raise awareness, try and integrate people, and it will be simple. I'm colored, so people generalize about colors a lot. So especially when it comes to like culture days and stuff, we don't really have a culture. So then everybody's like, oh, you must join like maybe the Kosa culture, the Zuli culture, and wear something like this and that. And then I'm like, no disrespect, but I want to try and find my own culture. We need to take action. We can't just speak and say that we want change. Change needs to be physically activated. Wealth for me is not really important. It's the, the only thing which is important is like a standard of living which is dignified for you and your family. It doesn't matter how many zeros you have in your account for me personally. As long as you, you're able to live in a very dignified way. Like for instance, if you have your necessities like the, the, your running water, electricity, and the general basic needs, food, shelter. I think now that everyone's on social media and there's so much more focus on the younger generations and the potential we hold, it's so much easier to communicate what we want. And I think to keep that up is really great. When you're given rights, a lot of people forget that you also have responsibility so that you don't violate the next person's right. People come from different backgrounds, so it's all about a perspective. You learn to hate, but you are initially born loving. Do you understand? So we should start with ourselves, or should I say the parents should start with themselves. Because one thing is that a kid that's racist, they get it from their parents. Being university students, we can see we're living in a time where protest is such a big thing. And eventually, if we just keep at the fight as women, there'll be no choice but to just give us what we're fighting for, give us that equality. What are the challenges we face in trying to define racism? It probably defines hate speech way too broadly because it takes it out of the terrain of group harm into individual harm. It takes it out of public harm into private harm. If you allow someone to pass a law, you're basically saying they won. They won because we have to have a law so that I can be protected. You can't take my dignity. After a spirited debate with the student body, we caught up with advocate Tuli Madonzela. The concerns around hate speech are covering only a part of racism. The big concern around racism is systemic and structural racism, where many of our people still find themselves at the bottom of society, and at that bottom of their society, they 
don't experience some of the fruits of democracy, which are economic, social, and uh, education and, and other things. To address economic racism, we've got to go back to the Equality Act. The Constitution always understood that we needed to achieve equality. In other words, we created a breach to a new society which was going to be premised on social justice, but we were not in that new society yet. The breach was the Constitution included in the package were legislation such as the promotion of equality and unfair discrimination act. Chapter 5 of that act has not been implemented. My view is government must, as a matter of priority, before implementing new laws, implement Chapter 5 of the promotion of equality and prevention of unfair discrimination. Why is it important in this debate? It offers a framework for conducting an analysis of residual racist-based inequalities in all areas of life. And it's not just racism, gender, disability, and race, those three. And after that analysis, plans have to be created for, uh, for reducing those inequalities. And that would be in all areas of society, land, property, education. Money is an, it's a big issue. Money is a big issue, and and uh, there's a human right element in that. You know, uh, as a person, you have to have a bit of financial stability, and and us as black people, we don't have that, and we know the reason why. Racism is not just uh, what is in people's heads. Uh, racism is not just the prejudice that uh, that manifests itself amongst uh, those who feel inferior and those who feel superior. But uh, racism is also a function of uh, the, whether how many people in our country feel live daily, wake up daily, feeling that uh, we live in a society of equals. So, so those who who don't have the means to support uh, their own families would not feel as equal uh, uh, to those who have everything more than the means they, they need to support uh, their own lives. Well, I think we've done a lot legislatively, um, but I think what we're realizing is that race is not an issue that can be legislated away. I think it has a lot to do with issues of inequality. So unless we, we address inequality in society and, um, and deal with issues of privilege, um, deal with issues of the fact that for a very long time many people in this country have not had the opportunities to education, to employment, um, Unless we deal with those issues, um, we, we're not going to move far. So although we often say, you know, we have to think about social cohesion and so on, there are certain things that we must address before we can talk about social cohesion. I think businesses can do a lot, but I also think businesses have been doing a lot already, which we do not acknowledge uh, enough. Um, <clears throat> business, for example, over many years in South Africa's democracy now started with diversity training of their staff, sensitivity training, understanding the colleagues' backgrounds and uh, experiences where they're coming from. I know that FNB uh, years ago started with a mentoring program where they had uh, young black professionals mentoring senior. Uh, white managers uh, and a lot of those kind of initiatives are going unnoticed uh, and I think we need to acknowledge that a little bit more I think business can still do much more but where do people go to report incidents of racism and how complicated is it an applicant in an equality court to actually needs to lodge a complaint of whatever nature né? Firstly, we have dedicated clerks in each and every equality courts, as well as dedicated, as well as trained magistrates regarding sale. The applicant can forth with bring uh, 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 with him or her, you know, a, a, a legal representative, and or and or uh, 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 be represented né? 
by chapter 9 institutions. Now, chapter 9 institutions are those institutions that are supporting our constitutional democracy. For an example, the Human Rights Commission, the Public Protector, the, the Commission on Gender Equality, and the, and the like. The process looks like it's quasi-judicial. It's informal, it's held in a courtroom, there's no prosecutor. Now, the magistrate, who's the judicial officer, conducts proceedings, you see. So it's very much informal, and the main rationale at the end of the day is to ensure that all parties are actually held, and a favorable decision is actually awarded. We should accept the responsibility to forge ahead with transforming our, both our economy and our society in general so that every single one of uh, uh, our people can feel that you know, they have a place, they have a stake uh, in this country. And someone who has forged ahead and staked his claim in the new South Africa is Richard Mabonya, who saw an opportunity in a place nobody else thought to look and grabbed it with both hands. Well, you know, as a young man, uh, I think I did uh, sort of uh, project myself to be someone who could become a businessman. Mabonya Mall is a, is, is a, is a, um, a product that gave me a wonderful satisfaction because uh, I, it was a fight of 28 years when I kept applying to put up the mall there, got turned down, and I kept knocking at the doors. And everybody, but everybody that I spoke to, they did not ever believe that uh, you could put up a mall in a township and that mall becomes successful. 75, 80% of the customers in the cities are black and they know what they want and they are conscious of quality. And indeed, you know, our people, they, they like to buy a, a brand, a good things. If you come to them with something that is inferior, Believe in me, you, you lose your money. And I always felt that uh, whilst I'm making a little bit of money, I should also be in a position where I create job opportunities and uh, make life worthwhile for our people. And the mall as it stands now, uh, believe in me, it has contributed so much in uh, upgrading uh, the lives of the people of Soweto. And uh, it has also helped immensely in uh, bringing up the value of property in Soweto. Richard Maponya's story is one of many positive township entrepreneur stories that has aided in boosting the economy of the townships from purely survivalist and micro-businesses into fully-fledged organizations that give back to the community and enrich people's lives by creating job opportunities. This is the story of a man who triumphed over both economic and systematic racism. Townships like Soweto now have booming economies of their own. But how do we combat all these legacy elements of racism and apartheid that still seem to exist in our society? What's being done about it? In order to actively combat racism, the Anti-Racism Network of South Africa, ANSA, has been established. The Nelson Mandela Foundation and the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation facilitated the formation of ANSA and currently serve as a secretariat. On the 26th anniversary of the announcement to release Madiba and the unbanning of liberation organizations, ANSA, representing more than 80 organizations around the country, have strengthened efforts to fight racism by launching Anti-Racism Week from the 14th to the 21st of March 2016. The reason why we've actually become part of the anti-racism campaign is to remind ourselves and we believe the only tool that's available to all of us and as a constant reminder 
to say end racism and say no to racism can only be done through the medium of education. I think the time has come that we need to now combat or take on or fight specific incidents, uh, incidences of racism. And people feel that rather than just saying a non-racial South Africa, it's a concept that we're striving for as a broader vision. But what we need to do is to combat actual incidents or examples of, of, raci uh, of racism. And that's where the notion of an anti-racist campaign has emerged. The way to deal with racism is not to polarize. To the struggle for a non-racial South Africa uh, is, is, is something that we, our generation has to win. Uh, we can't polarize uh, South Africans. I think we've done astonishingly well. And I'll say that partly I was in Mozambique after Mozambique became independent. And, and the spirit was tremendous, but it couldn't be sustained. And it ended up with civil war. Uh, and, and huge loss of life and millions of refugees and destruction of property. We've avoided all that in South Africa. We take that for granted. Determination of wanting to create things and the uh, hard work, of course, uh, backed by education, you know, uh, that is the answer. I hope young people in schools and universities and sports fields, if Springbok rugby players can overcome it enough to play together in the scrum, then my goodness we can overcome it. And when I see young black cricketers emerging and the way the whole country rejoices, I say there's hope for us. Local government has to ensure that youth empowerment is the main um, program in there. It should be their main program because majority of people who vote are youth. So we have all the resources, just that maybe we just don't give ourselves enough time. That's what I think. The youth of today must teach their kids to not be racist. You know what I mean? They must teach them uh, to live together as a diversity. It's, it's, it's something that will take, a, you know, it's a process of 10, maybe 20 years, but I think that the, the whole concept of education has to be taken more seriously. Um, because at the end of the day, education is sort of the fundamental, the fundamental sort of step into improving the, the states of the, the, the country and the states of the state of the continent for that, for that same matter. For us to communicate, we need to understand each other's languages. I think we get along better in terms of like, our living circumstances of people pull together, you understand? And like there's integra like better integration in terms of like people like uh, from different races going to different places where other like so-called races live. The future, I think it's, it's a positive future. Yeah, the divisions are fading, just fading very slowly, but they're fading. I feel as if, if we want to get along better as races, we have to focus on the good parts of each race and know our cultures better and understand each other more before we can judge one another. I'm very positive here. Yeah. I actually can't wait to, to finish school, start working and just explore the labor world. When everyone is racist, then the country is not moving in a, in a positive direction. Everyone is, has their own opinions because of, your, because of your beliefs, your religion or your color. Okay, I see the future as a place where there's no racism at all, where we can all just live as one big happy family together, where there's no fights and nobody discriminating anybody. The youth should get involved in anti-racism week because it intrigues um, patriotism within the youth. It, um, because we're building our future leaders. So in order for our country to be a non-racist country and a non-discriminatory non, um, non country and a free country where there is Ubuntu. And letting someone 
display racist acts in front of you, even if it's not towards you, you should speak up about it. It's don't react in a violent manner. You don't have to be rude about it. I mean, there's so many events around the world where people were passively resisting things, and you can do that as long as you make your say, as long as you as an individual say, yes, I am non-racist within my heart, and I'm not one who displays racism, but it's also important to ensure that others aren't racist either. <laughs> When we solve the question of racism, there will be other questions that, of class, for example, of gender, uh, that which we must continue to grapple with. There will be questions, other questions of environment. So uh, I think this generation had a different struggle, but we must be comfortable with struggle. So all of us across the colour spectrum, we all have our differences and we're all still dealing with the legacy of apartheid and need to realise as a nation that those wounds are going to take generations to heal. But with initiatives that have support of government, we're firmly on our way. In conclusion, we think it appropriate to leave you with the wise words of Maya Angelou. In minor ways we differ, in major we're the same. I note the obvious differences in every sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Peace.